You are in for a true treat today. On Thursday, November 7th, at the Rococo Theater, you will see the hard work of students at the University of Nebraska from the College of Journalism and Mass Communication and the hard work of Bruce Thorson, a UNL associate professor at the College of Journalism and Mass Communications. Because back in May, Bruce took a dozen students to Ethiopia for three weeks to document through stories and audio and photographs successes the West typically doesn't hear or see. Two of those dozen students join Bruce today on Lincoln Live. Adam Pribble from O'Neill is a junior. Brianna Sokup from Omaha is a senior. And of course, Bruce is here too. Brianna, Adam, Bruce, thanks all for coming in. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, uh, Bruce, I'll start with you because you've taken students all over the world in these journalism assignments. What drew you to Ethiopia? We uh, had a former grad student that uh, is from Ethiopia. He came here to UNL, got his PhD, uh, is now back in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa teaching at the university there. Um, that gives us a great in-country contact, somebody that can help uh, coordinate uh, our adventures on the ground there, deal with lodging, transportation issues. We used about 10 of their students as uh, interpreters for the students on these trips uh, because we are going to countries in which there is need and there's always a, a level of safety factors that need to be considered. When we do these trips I don't let the students work alone so we typically try to find other journalism programs anybody else on the ground that we can find other journalists who will help us, help our students work on their stories and deal with any of the uh, cultural community and people issues that the, our students need to know about. Had it not been for that student, would Ethiopia have been a pin on your map as a oh, place to go? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it it's, was? Yeah, the, the, the need there is, is very great. There's a, a lot of issues that the, the people there are having to deal with, and, and uh, you get to see all about them in the show that we're doing at the Rococo. That's on November 7th. What time? Starts at 6.30. We have a li we'll have live African music. And uh, then the multimedia pieces will start at 7.30. We'll, we will have a raffle in which we've got some uh, autographed books and other items from uh, various uh, people and uh, some other items from local businesses. And that money will go to a scholarship fund for a student on a future trip. That's a fun venue. I like going into the Rococo. November 7th at 6.30. What were some of the, the similarities and differences in the challenges and opportunities for this trip compared to some of the others you've had? Every country that we've been to, we've been to seven so far, and we do two trips now every year. So we go in December, January, and we go in May, and we are in country for three weeks. Um, and every country has been unique. Um, the students spend a lot of time researching the country and the people and the culture and the topics and issues before we go. So each student finds his or her own story and when we get there that's essentially what they work on. But um, during the students research they try to find those kinds of topics and issues that are, are relevant to what's going on in, in, the, in the country in the community as of today. What about the times in which we live? If you've gone to seven, two a year, that's three, four years ago. Anything different logistically, security-wise, anything different today than three, four years ago? No, not at all. Uh, like I say, safety is, is always my first concern when we go on these trips uh, because we don't go to comfortable places. I think that probably... <laughs> Probably one of the biggest issues that we, uh, or at least the students had to deal with on this trip as opposed to others was that the, uh, the students got to live in the international dorm on the campus of Addis Ababa University. And uh, that was a bit of a challenge for them because the, the dorm rooms were, what would you call them, Brianna? Um, well, it was an experience, that's just what I'll say. <laughs> um, they were definitely different than what I think any of us were used to. Different in what way? Um, the amenities, the size, yeah, just I mean, there comfort really, level? There's not really toilets. I mean, it's like a hole in the ground. and um, 
there were some rats. <laughs> uh, but nothing honestly too bad. And, and once I realized that we were actually staying in the disabled student dorm, um, there were like lots of kids in the dorms in wheelchairs or crutches. And I, I saw one of the students trying to use the bathroom in their wheelchair and I just sort of like had this realization, I need to stop complaining because I'm here for three weeks and you know, this is like, this is, you know, nice and this is their life and I'm lucky to even be here. So Adam, what was your comfort level? A lot different than O'Neill, Nebraska. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the dorms there, it was pretty much like camping. That's how I kind of looked at it. <laughs> but, you know, like uh, Brianna said, we were only there for three weeks and every day just there's so many reminders of how lucky our lives here are, you know, so it, we got through it. It wasn't too bad. Why'd you go, Adam? Um, as a junior journalism student, you know, I'm still kind of learning this craft and I figured the best way to learn how to swim is jump in the middle of the ocean and getting on board this trip was definitely like that. I mean, learning storytelling techniques and stuff like that. It was, yeah, incredible. As a senior, Brianna, this would have been your last chance to go on one of these. That probably was a factor. Uh, yeah, I, this is my third, my third trip. Where I, else have you gone? I went to Kyrgyzstan and I went to Brazil. Um, so I went to Kyrgyzstan in December of 2011 and Brazil of December of 2012. And how does this one compare? Um, oh my gosh, I think they're all so different. Um, Kyrgyzstan was just, I, I mean, I had got, just gotten into Bruce's class that, that, that first semester of my junior year. I kind of started late in the photography game. I was kind of a little scared. I didn't really know what I was doing. And it sort of just happened that um, I could go on this trip and I was studying abroad like right after I got home. So I, I didn't know anything about Kyrgyzstan. I didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. And it was honestly like the best experience of my life. And I think that trip really just stands out to me because that's when I realized that this is really what I want to do. I really loved it. But you both have global experience, Adam, some military uh, experience. Yes, sir. Yes, um, yeah, in the Navy, it was it was more like a hit and run on these countries. We'd go there for four to five days and leave port. But on this trip, being there in three weeks, you really get immersed in the culture. So it was a much different experience. Does, did your military service at all, you, the discipline, the expertise, the, the vision that you get, did, did any of that come into play, benefit you on this trip? Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Like I felt comfortable in other countries, oh. but um, also these people thought I'd be security for him, but they didn't really know I was a computer technician, so it didn't really <laughs> help too much on that. But <laughs> so, what were your assignments? What what were you? What did Bruce give you as tasks to do, Brianna? Do you mean like what was our stories? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I did my story on um, early marriage in Ethiopia, child marriage. When I first started researching, I found. Um, photos from Stephanie Sinclair. She's a pretty famous photographer and she covered, she's covered um, child marriage in multiple countries. And I saw her Ethiopia stuff and I was like, wow, I've always wanted to do a story about women. You know, all the, the other trips I kind of started and I just ended up doing stories on other things, which I loved, but I kind of wanted to focus on um, women and girls issues. And so I, I looked into this child marriage and it was actually, it was a little difficult. I had to leave Addis. I had to go up north to the Amahara region and it took a little research and convincing, but it was really safe and I had a translator go with me and then eventually one of our, um, Brian Lehman, one of the people who comes on the trip, I don't know what, what his name is. He's a special assistant. Spe right? Yeah, special assistant. <laughs> um, he joined me up there and I had a week because um, it took me about two weeks to do all the research and stuff and I went to the wedding of a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old. It was a double wedding um, in the middle of nowhere. And then I followed, um, during that same week, kind of followed around a 14-year-old girl who's um, been married twice. She's in her second marriage right now. Did you say a 9-year-old was getting married? Yes, and a 12-year-old. 9-year-old was marrying? Um, I think her husband was like 15, and the 12-year-old really? was marrying someone who's about my age, 20, 21. How does that work? Uh, uh, it's what they do in Ethiopia. That's the culture? Yeah. It's, it's illegal in Ethiopia, and there are they have done a lot recently to try to curb it, but it's a tradition. It has to do a lot with their religion and with um, sort of just the culture there. And it mostly only happens in rural regions. And the Amahara region in northern Ethiopia is, they have a pretty high percentage. How willing were they to allow you to take video and photographs and um, record? It took a little convincing. And, you know, 
um, I went to the wedding, I think. it's Weddings are 10 days long there. It's like a feast. It's not like a wedding here. They don't walk down the aisle. It's not anything like you'd expect. And um, I went, I think, four times. And the last time, you know, that's when it sort of, I think they, I don't think they were annoyed. I think there were some miscommunications and um, I was supposed to be able to follow them home because they take the brides back to their parents' house. But I don't really know what happened. It was pretty confusing and I think all in all, I was re they were super nice, and I don't think that they're bad people. They just have a different culture, and it definitely needs to be changed, and I think it is really detrimental to the girls. But, um, you know, it wasn't exactly what I expected. Adam, what was your focus? Uh, well, it ended up being um, this uh, little autistic boy that lives at a homeless shelter in Addis Ababa. Um, after a week, my primary story didn't really pan out, and I landed up on... I ended up at this homeless shelter where I found this autistic boy. And the whole shelter, it's for mentally disabled and elderly, bedridden, and they all kind of just take care of themselves. And it was just really interesting. And I got to stay with them for the remaining two weeks. So you had to make an adjustment. Your official idea, your, your first idea initially didn't turn out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just logistics, um, miscommunications, m some missed opportunities on my fault, but yeah. I think I ended up in the right place. Bruce, how open are you to the ideas the students bring in? I mean, is, any, is, is, is everything on the table? We start out uh, usually about six, eight weeks before we leave, after I get the, the team of students put together. Um, and we start meeting once a week, and again, they start doing their research. And we just start throwing ideas up on a whiteboard. And they'll come in with, three, four, five different ideas, and uh, we just put them all up on the whiteboard, and then we just start talking about each one. And over the next couple weeks or whatever, we just start picking off the weaker ones, taking them down off the board, and um, at that point, the students are pretty focused on what one or two stories. We tend to try to make sure they've got a primary story that they can work on, and then a backup story so that, because there are times when we get to the country and three days later we find out that whatever the story was about uh, has come to an end for whatever reason and then they've got to have something else uh, to work on so um, we're very open to their ideas and just making sure that it's going to be a story that's doable and a story that will be safe to do. So, you know I, I, I'm always envious a bit of of journalists who are given um, weeks to do an assignment, we we are given about an hour and a half sometimes, right. or we're given 15 minutes to develop a story in radio. So uh, I think that's a luxury to be able to go in, and especially in a case like yours, Adam, where your first idea doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. And even um, Bruce let me, he gave me a couple of days just to wander around the city with my translator. And just Thinking find of, something. Yeah, absolutely. That's that flexibility has to be. That's that's a learning well, experience the other, the too. Well, other, the other thing that we do is is like I said before we leave the country. The I've made usually somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty or twenty five contacts before we leave. Each student has got in the neighborhood of probably eight to ten contacts that they've all made in regards to their story. Before we leave the country, I arrange uh, to find a restaurant in the location that we're going to be at and either the first or second night that we're there we have a, a dinner already arranged and we invite all the contacts that we've made to come to dinner and we take care of hosting that dinner and uh, the last three trips we've had probably in the neighborhood of like 35 to 40 contacts show up for dinner and these are all journalists, student journalists, community activists, um, people associated with NGOs, nonprofit governmental organizations, uh, various other individuals who know something about the community, the people, and the culture, and the topics and the issues that are there. I can't help but think of the conversation that we had after a trip that you made just around Nebraska. Remember how ad lib that trip oh, was yeah, oh, absolutely. for you it was, and the students? It was, it was, it was a, just day by day. It was the most serendipitous journey I've ever been on. Yeah. I mean, every day I was just running into somebody else that said, oh, you ought to go do a story about this person or that person, and I'd go do that, and then they'd lead me to somebody else and somebody else, and 
things just fell into place. And, Stumble and on a rodeo or a, 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 a county fair going on somewhere. Exactly, and, and that's what these these trips are about too. It's and it's teaching the students to not only deal with how to make a story, but just deal with the obstacles that keep you from getting to a story, and dealing with a different country and culture and language, and they all figure out how to get around real quick. And the students staying in the dorms where there were no toilets, literally just a hole in the ground, figured out very quickly that the library, which was a few minutes walk <laughs> away, uh, had, a, had a, a more decent restroom in it than the, did, did, did the dorm. So they started using that. <laughs> Adam and Brianna, I want you to think of stories, experiences, all right, that are unique to you, Adam, in your pursuit of your story, Brianna, y your unique experiences with this wedding. And uh, also, Bruce, we'll, we'll talk, too, about the show that's coming up November 7th at the Rococo and what folks uh, can expect to see. We're talking about a, a, a May trip made by Bruce and a dozen students from the University of Nebraska College of Journalism and Mass Communication to Ethiopia. Stay with us. We'll have more on Lincoln Live in a moment. Lincoln Live today is with Bruce Thorson, uh, UNL Associate Professor at the College of Journalism and Mass Communication. Adam Pribble is here, too, from O'Neill, and Brianna Sukup from Omaha. Uh, Brianna is a senior. Adam is a junior at the university. They are among uh, a dozen students that went to Ethiopia for three weeks to document through stories and photographs uh, successes that we here in the West typically don't hear or see. And I want to talk about Success, that's the term I use, but you get criticized too for or accused, Bruce, of, of photographing too much of the negative. Before we get into that, let's, let's uh, give a sense of what listeners will see on November 7th at the Rococo. Starting at uh, 6.30, there'll be, we've hired a, a, an African band, and so at 6.30 there'll be African drummers uh, outside the Rococo. Uh, for about a half an hour. Then they'll move inside onto the stage where they have um, probably 10 or 12 different African dancers, traditional costumes, drumming, and they'll do about a 30 minute performance of traditional African song and dance. Then about uh, 7.30 uh, we'll start the raffle and we'll get some of those items out of the way. The students have 10 stories that they want to show and we'll begin those and then at some point, and we haven't yet figured this out, either before or after their story appears, uh, each student that worked on his or her story will give about a five minute presentation on what their experience was, what they learned from it, what they brought back from it of being in Ethiopia and, and dealing with people who are in need. Have you written up that speech yet, Adam? Uh, I'm hoping to get very inspired in the next couple of days about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be a no. They, they, <laughs> might, they might just now be finding this out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't. <laughs> Brianna's <laughs> going, me. I didn't know that. Uh, it's my understanding that, and, and successes, I've used that term a couple of times, that the successes that we here in the West typically don't see or hear about out of a poor, poor country like Ethiopia. But you tell me that you're, you've, you've reached criticism or you've, you've had criticism leveled against you, not only for this trip, but others about focusing too much on, on sadness and negatives. We get people sometimes who, uh, in, and usually during the presentations, uh, who will come up and just say, you know, why do you, why do you, there is a lot of beauty in all of these countries that I go to. Why don't we photograph these beautiful places and beautiful people and other aspects of life and the endowment that we have uh, is specifically for the mission of going to an emerging country in which there is need and we do want to focus our cameras on some of these issues not because we're trying to exploit anybody not because we're trying to put anybody down we're hoping that we can inspire other people to maybe other journalists to do the same thing we're hoping we can inspire people to, maybe they could jump in and, and help. And I think the stories that the students have should do that. 
That's my hope anyway. Brianna, back to you and the weddings that you attended, a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old? Mm -hmm. yeah, a nine-year-old married a 15-year-old. Yeah, um, and you know, the ages are, are, that's what people told me, and you know, people don't really keep track of ages that much there, but that's, that was the consensus from most of the people there, <laughs> that did, the ages of those people. Did you find yourself thinking and hearing yourself ask, is this really happening? Um, I guess I just researched it so much previously that I, I was, I was pretty familiar with the subject, and um, so I honestly, I mean, it, it was, I was just really happy to be there, because I mean, it is illegal, and I was told by lots of people before I went that I wouldn't be able to find a wedding, and I wouldn't be able to go to one, and no one would let me take pictures. Are you saying it's illegal? It, it's or illegal. It, it, it it's, is legal. It's illegal it's in Ethiopia illegal. To, to marry before the age of okay. 18. But, um, you know, it's still happening. See, I, I would find myself thinking of a nine-year-old that I know back here in the United States, whether it's my yeah. cousin or my niece, or I find myself it thinking, was, good grief, I've got a, I know a nine-year-old at home. Yeah, it was really hard to detach myself from the situation, and I don't think I ever could fully. Um, but, you know, I, I felt really lucky that, that those people let me in on that part of their lives. And, um, you know, I did feel pretty bad for the girls, and it was hard. But I'm really glad I did the story. Um, I think it's a really important issue, and it's happening in lots of countries all over the world. I'm guessing you can't help but think, sitting here right now, talking about them, what's going on half a world away to these couples. Yeah, yeah. and it, you know, I'll never really be able to find out what happened to them. The wedding I went to was, you know, 45 minutes from any sort of paved road, and I would never figure know how to get back there. And they don't have, you know, phone numbers, email addresses. They've never even seen a computer, so um, yeah, I, I probably won't ever be able to find out what happens to them, but I'll, at least I'll think about them all the time. Can you recall for me a powerful moment for you? I, so when I was sitting there, I, I first got there and everyone's you know, freaking out um, because some of them had never seen a white person before. And um, I, I'm getting all these people around me and they're all joking and my translator is trying to translate, you know, things people are saying to me, but there's, you know, 30, 40 people around me. And um, one of the guys was laughing um, and saying that we needed to cheer up the 12 year old because she was really sad. And we were like, well, why is she so sad? Um, and he was like, oh, because um, she doesn't want to do the things a wife should do for her husband. And I, I know they were like alluding to certain things. And uh, it just like really broke my heart um, because she's 12. And I, I always thought, maybe I'm selfish, but I thought a lot about myself when I was 12 and like <laughs> where I was at. And even as a teenager, the other girl, uh, Melishu, I, I hung out with, she's 14. And I was just like, you know, I was nowhere near these girls' maturity level and I was nowhere near ready for this kind of stuff. And I, I can kind of think that they probably aren't either, so. Adam, how about for you? Um, you probably are thinking of the, the autistic boy um, put us back into this home to give, give us some sense about w where you are and what's happening to this child. Okay, well, where you stayed at was, the name of the place is called Macedonia, and it was basically a, a wealthier Ethiopian gentleman just opened up his home to homeless people, but not just regular homeless people, mentally disabled, uh, elderly, I mean, the worst of the worst. And so that's where this boy lives. He was dropped off there no record, no documentation. He's 10 years old now. And um, he has severe autism and never been treated, never been had any kind of therapy. So no motor skills, uh, he wears diapers, he's fed. Um, and the one of the sadder things is they don't have the resources to care for him 24 seven that he needs. And so sometimes they have to restrain him with a rope and sometimes he's left in a room tied up. And so, yeah, that's basically the background. And the big, what hit me was I ended up talking to someone who was giving therapies to autistic kids in Ethiopia. And she had photos of these children 10 years later when they're 20 years old, when a soft cloth rope won't restrain them anymore. And the cha they're chained and it's pretty tough stuff. Can you capture that in photographs? I tried. <laughs> um, it's tough. That, that's the, my worst fear is that I 
I make flat characters that I don't round them out. They don't see a real person. You just see the problem. Um, hopefully, I'm comp- gonna accomplish that or accomplish that. Um, that's some deep learning, Bruce. <laughs> that's good stuff. That's that's why we do what we do. That's good stuff. Just enough time to remind folks that will will they. Will there be images? Will there be photographs? Will there be video, audio? What will what will have? What will people have as far as the media that the students all of that came and back more? With? Okay, <laughs> starts with the drumming outside Rococo. Yeah. The other so, thing I wanted to say too is is kind of back to why we go to these countries and do the stories that we do is that the the people that we find in these stories, the the beauty of their character and their perseverance, their personality, is incredibly strong for the situations that they have to live in, under. Living in dirt huts and cooking over an open fire, not having any of the resources that, that we have here. Their hospitality, their generosity, their hard work ethic is unbelievable, quite frankly. And uh, I know a lot of students have come back from these trips and they have made Facebook friends out of their translators and whatnot and other people that they've met around and uh, who knows maybe in 25 years from now they'll all go back to Ethiopia and have a reunion with their translators (laughs) and the people that did their stories on. Well if you've never been to one of Bruce's previous shows after one of these trips you're in for a a real treat it's it's all quality folks and there's another one coming Thursday November 7th at the Rococo starts at 6 30. Bruce thank you very much. Thank you. Adam, Brianna thank Thank you too. Thanks everybody for being here on Lincoln Live.